about yourself. I was going to do it, but I think it's better if you do. Okay. <laughs> well, um, like Diana said, my name is Roby Gay. I'm Kia Ani Ishle, I am Navajo. I am Towering House, born into Zuni clan. And I am a potter and teacher here in the Silver City, New Mexico area. I am currently teaching ceramics and general art at Cobre High School here in Bayard, New Mexico, which is just a stone throw away from Silver. Um, I've been working with clay for quite a while uh, since I started in college in, 19, in 1993 and I've been it just experimenting and learning all the time. I have a business called Najoni Pottery. I've been making pottery, functional pottery as well as one of a kind pottery, some sculptural pieces, but through everything, through all the years, my work has evolved and changed. I um, am and have always been interested in the Japanese block carving techniques. And I've always thought of the blocks themselves being just works of art. I, I was always really interested in the texture and how they feel. So while I was getting my formal art education, I experimented a whole lot with um, printmaking, the whole printmaking process with linoleum cuts and wood carvings, wood block printing. And once I started getting my pottery started, I've always had that in the back of my mind. So after years of just kind of just goofing around with my work and getting my work out there in the world, uh, I started incorporating carving into my work. I originally started out just using um, your regular linoleum carving tools like this. You know, if you are, are all familiar with this little carving tool, there's lots of different shapes and sizes there. So when I first started carving on my work, I was actually using this and carving on clay pieces, um, tiles, and anything I could get my hands on. And using this particular carving tool. And out, over the years, I've kind of, one day I was thinking, you know, I want something, I want more of a control method of carving. So I switched over to creating my own carving tools. Now you can go purchase these carvings, some really cool carving tools from Diamond Core tools and all that, but I, started creating and making my own carving tools just for my own my own needs and my own purposes and this is one that i that i developed that i made and this is just a repurposed um paintbrush with some little metal little metal um ribbons here that i that i found that i picked up and I believe this particular one, I've been using this one now for several years. This particular one here is a, a piece of uh, the, that metal stripping that is inside of a, um, the wooden rulers. You know, I, uh, I've had one of these for a long time and that little stripping just kept coming out, kept coming out and I just took it out. And after a while taking, looking at, taking a look at it, I decided to use it for this. So I've had this one for several years. And today I'm gonna to show you guys how I make this. So very easy, very simple method. Um, I have two different sides here. I have this side, a bigger side for carving, uh, making larger lines and a smaller side on the back end here. And these are very easy. And um, I started making these when, before I was really familiar with online purchasing like, um, <laughs> through Amazon or anything like that. And actually before Diamond, before I even found Diamond Core tools, cutting um, carving tools, you know, so I, I, you know, being in a small, small community um, in Silver City, um, I wasn't able to go out and purchase um, tools like this. So I had to figure out a way to just make my own tools. 
So this is one thing that I developed uh, uh, in my own studio. And um, it's a carving tool that I, that I use all the time. So, so and, and I, show, I show my students here at Cobra High School how to make these tools as well. But um, pretty much that's it. And um, I've also used regular just needle tools, anything I can get my hands on. Um, I've even used, also used just a pocket knife, you know, carving with this little pocket knife. A lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll shape and cut up uh, and reshape a feddling tool. So, well, other than that, that's a gist of what I was, I'm gonna be working with today. I'm gonna go through how I create this little, little nifty carving tool, you know, and, and also just let you guys know, there are lots of tons and tons of different companies out there that, cr that create and make, make wonderful, wonderful um, carving tools. Um, this was pretty much free, <laughs> but you can pay, you know, up to like 40, 50 bucks for, for some pretty nifty carving tools. But um, anywho, um, anything else, Diana? Um, yeah, wait until I took a sip of water. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do you want to show a couple pieces just to give an idea? Um, and then, then we can look at the process from the back end. Um, here is a piece here that I carved. And this is just carving straight onto the leather hard clay. And I let this, after it is carved, I'll dry it. I'll let it get dry, bone dry, bisque fire it. And then at that point, I'll inlay an iron oxide mixture within my carvings and then I'll sponge away all the that whole area there and leaving the iron oxide within the image that within the carvings there and all my carvings that I do within my work revolve around my family experience my experience as um as a Native American in today's society. And uh, there's lots of different things that um, I carve, but it's all related to my Native background. Um, so that's one thing that I like to stress in a lot of all, in all my students is, you know, to carve and create pieces that is inspired by their experiences. You know, through pottery, I've always found that it's kind of hard and to break away from everyone else's work, you know, because everyone can make a mug. There's a lot, tons of people out there that are making mugs. Anyone can make pictures, um, vases, and all that good stuff, which is great. But how do I break away from every, the pack? How do I break away the pack? And this is one way that I found that um, I'm able to break away from the pack of potters that are out there. I am, um, by incorporating myself, by incorporating my, my background within my work. And I'm always telling my students, think about where you are, who you are, where you come from. Um, and your, you, you personally, and incorporate that into your work. And, and at that point, you'll, be, you'll find that you are gonna break away from the norm. So, and like I was saying, this is um, one way I do that. And the images here, I, I used to pre-draw everything and then carve, carve out all the pencil marks that, that I um, create. Uh, but now I just go ahead and just start carving away because before I always found that my, my images were really rigid, really tight. And I wanted my my imagery on my pottery to 
match my pots. My, I, I, I worked a lot to create my, my pottery pieces to be, to show movement, to kind of show that fluid movement, um, not to be so rigid. So I wanted my imagery to kind of match that as well. So, so, so that was yeah. one way for me to, to make my images a little bit more free. You're more connected with the piece then more directly and you're yes, responding yes. to the clay and, and, and your tool is your drawing medium and it's not one step removed. Yes. So you're more connected. Yes. So that's kind of what I do. <laughs> I am. Um, here's another, this is on a white, the white clay body. I also, I also have a red clay body as well. And um, when I use my red clay body, I will go ahead and I've made a, I use my, my, the white clay body that I have and I turn that into a slip. And I brush that slip onto my red clay body at the leather hard stage. And when they are both at a leather hard stage, I'll go ahead and, and carve. This is a piece that I carved here in my classroom. This is as an example for students. As you can see, it's got Totoro on there. It's not really Native American, but <laughs> so. And this is the, when it's fired, the white of the clay body, of the slip um, will be a nice, nice, um, will be white in color and the red stoneware on the, on the underside there will be a, a darker uh, will be a darker image on the within the carvings there and this piece here i i i don't inlay any um iron oxide into this i just let the i just let the um the clay body show through through the the white slip there So on this piece here, like I'll go ahead and glaze this whole area here with a clear glaze and another glaze on the inside as well as a little bit here and on the bottom here as well. And with when my, I don't have any examples here in my studio of what this will look like, but um, I normally use my copper um, matte turquoise glaze with this, with the clear. And where the copper and the clear mix, it creates a nice little reddish haze and then where where it mixed together up here up on top, you'll see that nice reddish flashing. So, and um, the two glazes here, not two glazes, but the, the, the two clay bodies here, my white clay body and my red clay body here are both uh, cone 10 clay bodies. So, and they work really well with one another. If you guys are using, um, a porcelain slip you might want to experiment with that a little bit more because some porcelains will will shrink a little bit faster or a little bit slower than um, the darker clay body you'll be using so if you're using two different clay bodies it's a little bit different so that's cool. one example okay anything else diana are there any questions so far no, no. I mean, someone mentioned anime, which I think is interesting because um, drawing on clay with an anime might be kind of fun. Yeah, you know, that's what this is. Um, Totoro is an, is an anime character and it's one of my favorite animes. And I'm an anime kind of guy, so I, I, I like to incorporate that every now and then. I mean, if you, if you take a look at my work, you know, it's not, it isn't really, um, I'm not, how do I say this? Hyper-realistic? Yeah, hyper-realistic. It's more comic, a more of a comic, it's got a comic book um, inspiration, you know, and that's just me. That's just my person, my, my, my personal flavor. Um, mm -hmm. Although I can, I can draw kind of a hyper-realistic um, in a hyper realistic way, but I just choose not to. It's not as fun for me. Well, I've no, always this, been, I've always speaks. been that comic book nerd. Yeah. And I've collected comics for years, and 
that's just something that's just how I like to draw and it's just it works when when I get into my zone of really having fun and if I'm going to be make using this um, and making a living with my work I would much rather have fun and and create image, images that I enjoy drawing in a style. I do have a question. Was this piece done the same way as the last piece you showed us? And the, actually the answer is no, right? Because you don't have a, a slip on top. I do not have a slip on top. This piece is, uh, this is the, the, um, the clay body here. It's a white stoneware clay body. And this is just the clay body showing through. On the other piece over here, I'm using two different clay bodies. I have my red clay body here. You can see that there. And I slipped that there. And you'll see it more here. You can kind of see that there. Right. So this is the clay body here, the, mm -hmm. my red clay body that I just threw. And also when I brushed on that slip. And I'm gonna show you how I get to this point here. I have another one set aside here, ready to be, to be worked on. Um, so if, is there any other questions before I move on to the um, next? Not yet, no. Okay, well, so let's move on. So I'm gonna show you really quickly how I create this little carving tool that I make. So I have this little band here, if you can see there. And again, this is just that little metal stripping on the inside of a, a wooden ruler, like 99 cents for a ruler, 50 cents some places. Um, and I'll just go ahead and very carefully bend this. You can take some pliers if you want. I just use my fingers because it's very, it bends very easily. Um, I just want to say one thing real quick. Um, I notice I have a big picture of you on the screen and lots of little ones. If someone wants to see the detail, if they double click on the picture of your hands, that you know you'll pop up bigger. Oh yes, I forgot to mention that as well. Yeah. And you'll see you'll see that um, it's under Romaine Begay. So, and I, I'm bending it right now. So at that point here, I'll go ahead and take this point here, and you can just very easily break it off with pliers, cut it off with pliers, but I'm just gonna bend it back and forth, back and forth, just keep moving it back and forth. And it's just gonna eventually snap off. You see that? Snaps off. Now, I have that point here. At this point, um, you can take a file and you can, and you can sharpen these edges up. If you have a, um, a bench grinder, you can very carefully go to the bench grinder and just sharpen them up a little bit there on each side. Now this is without it being sharpened. Okay, now this one here is sharpened. I just made this earlier. And you can see that sharp edge. So you gotta be careful with this part here because it will cut you. Now, now I have this here. Now I have my an old paintbrush here. So if you if you if you're a painter, you'll have these old paintbrushes you just chuck, you just throw away. No, use them. Make carving tools out of them. All right. Um, I, you can even take uh, old trimming old trimming um tools and you can carve. You can um take the take the carving part off and you can use them. You repurpose them. You know, so all I'm going to do here is you can see how it just fits right there. Fits perfectly. Now you can glue it down. But I'm not going to glue it down. Mine aren't glued down. I'll just go ahead and just tape it. I've got some tape. What kind here. of tape are you using? This, normally, I like to use the electrical tape. Um, but I can't find my electrical tape right now. So I'm going to use masking <laughs> tape. So all I'm gonna do is just, just tape it around, tape it tight. And there we have it. 
nice little carving tool. And I, I like to use this, the paintbrush because it's got, it's got a nice, nice um, wide handle there and it's easier for me to grasp, easier for, easier for me to drag along rather than a, the smaller, something small like this. So, and also with the tape, I could keep wrapping it around to fit my comfort. You know? Ergonomic. Yeah. So um, I'll go ahead and do that. And like I said, this will be able to, this moves around like this. And I don't mind that because sometimes you'll, you'll come to a, a point in your carving when I'll need to move this up just a little ways like that to get at a certain angle. So I don't mind that moving around, but you, I also have made some, which I just glued down with um, Gorilla Glue and it, it'll, it stays put there. It won't, this won't move, which is great, which is fine. But like I said, I, I don't mind it moving around because there are some times when I have to adjust the carving tool to suit my carving needs. And it's just totally up to you. Um, very easy, very easy tool. You can use a dowel. You can use, um, I know some people have bamboo. You can use the bamboo, the little bamboo shoots. And um, like I said, repurpose your old carving, old trimming tools. There's lots of different things you can use. Now, I have a slab here. Now, this slab is about leather hard. Uh, le the leather hard stage is where you want to start carving. So all I'm gonna do is just start carving on here. Like I said, you can draw out your image first if you want to, or, or you can just start carving away. This is just a, a, a I rolled out just a, um, a tile. Like so. So, so when you talk about leather hard, how do you know it's, you know, just at the right thing. Is it, can it be too soft? Can it be too um, um, dry? And if it's dry, what happens? If it's too wet, what happens? Great question. Now, so leather hard, look at this. Leather hard is a stage where, this is why I, I like to test. It's still bendable. You can bend it. So if you, if you guys can click on the, on the image where you can see my hands, the, the clay is still bendable, but it can still stand up on its own, okay? So that's the leather hard stage. And if you have wet clay, it'll just flop down. It'll be very difficult for you to carve on. So um, especially if, you, if you're carving on a, a, a vessel to hold the piece, because you're gonna, you're gonna, want, you're gonna want the pieces to be able to support itself. You want, you're gonna want to be able to hold the piece where you're not gonna damage it. And you're just gonna, you're just gonna slowly carve away. Now, so leather hard, in my experience, is the best time um, to carve. The, the carvings will, will, will come up very easily. The clay will be carved very easily. Um, if you get any harder than leather hard, um, sometimes you might chip the clay. You also might chip some of the slip away so, so leather hard for me is the best time. Um, again, it's a, it's about your your needs, what you are carving. So now take a look at how easily this is going to carve. Now I'm just going to make just a straight line. Boink. Very easily, it just carved out very easily. This is leather hard. Now, I'm just dragging it. I'm using it just like a pencil. I'm just dragging it towards myself. Now, I also, um, like I said, I use lots of different things here to create different um, prints, different things. So now, again, I don't really pre-plan anything. So I'm going to go ahead and just start carving right now. I started carving this here. And I want to match them both up. All right. So 
you can see it's just cutting that clay very nicely, very easily. Now, let's say, as when you're carving, there's a lot of things going on right now. For me, I like to, I like to I'm inspired by daily, everyday life. Now, there's a lot of things going on right now that are affecting everybody's lives. So, and a lot of this has to do with, of course, this coronavirus. And I'm just moving this along, dragging it along. You don't want to rush anything. And I'm kind of just brushing on you. If you want to, you can use a brush to kind of move it away, move the little the little carvings away. Uh oh, answer it. Now, in my carvings, in my work, a lot of my more recent work, I'm always carving a young Native American, young Navajo person. And it's a reminder of, for me, my youth growing up as a young Native American boy on a reser on the reservation. It's also a reminder of how I want my son to grow up. So all this comes into play. And I always have this young man with long hair. You know, not a lot of people know, but well, of course, people who see me here know that I have long hair. But when I was a young, young schoolboy, I also had long hair, but my hair was cut during my schooling. My, and a principal cut my hair. And it was a very traumatic experience for me as a traditional Navajo, traditional Native American. And so I'm always incorporating this young man, this young boy. And with long hair. And it's kind of funny because when I first started doing this, incorporating this to the young man, uh, one of my pieces that I made, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that experience I had with my hair being cut. You know, and and um, I was thinking, oh yeah, you know what? This stuff does not happen in today's society anymore. Thank God, you know. And two weeks after I had that piece fully fired, everything was ready to go. a young Native American boy in Texas got his hair cut. I remember that. His principal. And I was just blown away. I was like, holy cow. 
this stuff still happens. It's, it's just crazy. So, so very easy, very easy to carve. And it's just th thinking about what you want to carve. Your experience, your life. We all have different experiences within our lives, whether we are Native American, or we're not Native American, we're Hispanic, we're Anglo, we're Irish, whatever, you know. And incorporating your life experience, I think, will break everybody through and make it easier for you to break away from the norm. I mean, anyone can make a tile. I have this saying that I, that I have in my studio that I tell myself all the time, you know, anyone can create art or pottery, which is very true, but no one can create the art or pottery that I can create. Put yourself into this work. And I tell my students that all the time. It doesn't matter what you want to be <clears throat> when you grow up, you know, put yourself into your work and you'll become the best doctor, lawyer, teacher, police officer that you can. So, now, <clears throat> I really like texture. I love texture. I love um, how it's very easy to create texture within your, within clay. So I'll go ahead and goof around with that as well. You can kind of see, I'm just putting a little dot. I just flip this piece over. So. Now what I'll do right now is go ahead and let this dry fully dry and I'll go ahead and let it get fired, bis fired, and I'll go ahead and and incorporate the, um, introduce the iron oxide mixture into into the piece. Well, hey, we're, we're, we're like on short time here. So you know what? Let's just goof around a little bit more. Let's just say, hey, Let's pretend this is already bis fired. And let's go ahead and carve, not carve, but um, go ahead and introduce maybe the iron oxide mixture to it. Let me get a couple of the hair in here real quick. Again, you can see what I'm using the linoleum cutter cutting tool. Again, with this, be very careful when you're cutting. This guy is pretty sharp, and I've cut uh -huh. myself a number of times before, you know, but hey, that comes with the territory. If you want to do something like this, you know what? You got to be ready to be cut every now and then. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all right. Who's, that's the little price you pay for being an artist, you know what? My hands are so cut up. From, yep. loading, from loading the kiln, from all this stuff, you know. If, if you're a potter, you know what I'm talking about. Those little burrs you have on the pots that get sanded off once you once you cut yourself. Okay, I, I know which pot to sand now. <laughs> okay, now we're almost ready.
Now let's say this piece is ready. Now, let's say this piece is ready and I'm going to just introduce the iron oxide mixture in here. But like I said, normally I'll wait until this is this fired. But since you guys are here, we're all watching along. Let's just get it done right now. It'll be fine. Be all right. Yeah, I see a couple possibilities of um, when you go to wipe it down, though, will you still have, you're going to wipe it down dry? I'm going to talk about it here in a little bit right now. Okay. Just a second. Let me make sure everything's in the little cracks and crevices. So, now, there's several things you can do right now. You can let this guy totally get dry, dry and bone hard. And I've done this before and I like the, I like the texture it'll get. I'll get a Brillo pad and I'll just very lightly sand off the iron oxide. What's gonna happen is this is going to sand off the top layer of the iron oxide, okay? And it'll leave the inside, it'll leave the, the iron oxide within the crevices there. Or you can take a, a damp sponge, make sure it's not, not totally soaked. And you can just gently remove that layer. You can see it already coming out. Now if you're using a Brillo pad method, what's going to happen is it's going to leave some nice little nice little marks. Nice little sandy marks. So now with this technique, you can kind of pick certain areas. You can use a paintbrush. I'm just using the, the sponge itself. And I'm <laughs> sponging off certain areas that I want lighter, a lot lighter. Almost like uh, pre prepping the etching plate. Yes, it, this is pretty much, like I said, a lot of my stuff is, is inspired from a lot of different printmaking techniques. Have you ever done a carving that you've ended up printing? I mean, obviously you wouldn't put it through a press because um, it would kill it, but um, you know, will you do a rubbing? I never like put the, um, the layer of paper on here and did a rubbing with it. No, I've never done that. I've never done that. But um, so this is one one technique that you could use on your pottery, on a bis fired piece of pottery. On I mean, I, I mean a leather hard piece of pottery, and then bis fired and do all this, or you can do this all as it's, as it's leather hard. You know, whatever technique you like. Um, with with pottery, it's about patience. 
you know, there's a lot of, a lot of times it's about, you want to see the pieces right away sometimes. And, and this is one way you can, you can see that piece right away, how the carvings are going to be. Now I can come back and rework it if I want to. Maybe I want to kind of incorporate something in the background like this. And I will introduce any any um, iron oxide to these, but it's, you know, creating that background and foreground type technique. I'm just kind of moving away. So there's a lot of different things you can do with carving. So as you can see, nothing was really pre-planned. I'm just working with this piece. So, and there's my little guy there on a nice little tile. And I could put this tile wherever I want. You know, it could be just a tile as is. I can, you know, mount it somewhere. I can put it, put it within a, a, a mosaic design. Um, tile design, it doesn't matter what I could, there's lots of, there's endless opportunities for this tile piece here, but um, we went from something just as simple as just a piece of clay there at the leather hard stage to this, using a very pretty much primitive <laughs> carving instrument that we made at home. So there's lots of different ways you can do, you can use the material. Um, now, what, let's talk about other ways we can carve on our work. Um, I'm going to put this on a spinning doll right now. And you can see it in front of me. Let me move the camera back a little bit. All right, so I have my, my white clay mixture made already. And I just have a paintbrush. You could use, um, some people don't like texture when they're applying their slip. I like texture and it's the brush that I'm using. My brush marks will show the texture. So I like to use the brush marks that are showing texture as well. It's going to add to my carving, the finished piece. You'll be able to see some of that. texture. So you see the little brush marks there? Nice little clouds or hills and I'll let that get to the leather hard stage and then I'll go ahead and start carving as well on the pieces. I also 
use, like I said, that that white clay, that white clay that I use that slip is is my white clay body. You know, I have a white clay body and a red clay body. So it's my white clay body here. And I'll also let me clean this brush real quick. I will also use um, this is something that I was experimenting with uh, because I wanted my students to um, test this stuff out. Um, this is, um, I also use a um, underglaze. So this is an Amico velvet underglaze. Okay. So this is a pre-made underglaze. And all I do is just go ahead and charge my brush up. Now I'll go several coats of this. Now this velvet underglaze won't be shiny. It's gonna have a rough texture, but I'm okay with that because I'll, I can go ahead and incorporate a clear glaze over it to get a, to get it a little shinier. And I'll brush it. I'll brush the, a light coat of the clear glaze so it won't it won't make the underglaze run. So we have this piece now already. You can see that nice little velvety underglaze. Now, you can already see this stuff sets up pretty quick. So this guy will be pretty much ready for me to carve here in a little bit. Now, this is something that I made earlier, very quickly, just for you folks at home. Are joining today. Now, I'm going to use this technique here with this. Okay, so all I'm gonna all I'm gonna do is just start carving on my work. Now, I'm gonna take the piece here. I'm gonna carve a little bit here. Again, if you look at my work, a lot of times. I have this little wavy line down on the bottom. A lot of people just kind of think, oh, you know, those wavy lines. But no, to me, um, they're much more than just wavy lines. These are these little hills that are moving up and down, going outside of Silver City on my way home when I, when I go visit my, my family up north. I'll see these little hills. Now, a lot of times I'll take a sponge and make sure it's nice there. And I'll hold the piece here. And I'll, I can go ahead and start carving on here. Can you guys see okay? Yeah, I think so. All right. Now, incorporating a bit about what you know. Now, I grew up in a traditional Navajo household and I grew up hearing traditional Navajo stories. And one of the, one of the stories I really enjoy that my grandfather told me was about coyote. Now, they say coyote long ago had a wife and he, get, and he won her heart with a flower. And, and you'll see a lot of flowers in my work. So I'm working with the hills right now.
Now, I'm always working with four. A lot of times I'll work with four. Um, as I'm working, I'm, I'm either in, incorporating the number four within my work all the time to go along with the four sacred mountains, the four um, stages of life, the four sacred colors. So you'll see that within my work a whole lot. I wheel throw and I hand build. So it's just a matter of what mood I'm in. Okay, we got that going there. Now, this gonna this this piece is gonna have two different two different aspects of Navajo stories. One we're gonna incorporate. Butterfly, a butterfly. Now, I always incorporate two butterflies within my work. I am incorporating two because they're twins and in Navajo, stories, we have two twin warriors. Now this is a perfect carving for what's going on right now. Now these two twin warriors, they're called the twin monster slayers. Now these two twin warriors they were, they say they were not afraid of anything. Okay. That no matter what happened, they were always very smart, very courageous. And they weren't afraid of anything. And I always looked at that as, you know what, they're just naughty little kids. <laughs> naughty little kids. <coughs> and, um, one day, they took it upon themselves to rid the world of these monster beings. Now, the um, story goes is uh, these monster beings were weren't just you know any old monsters they were um there was there were famine um disease and things like that and so a lot of um these stories re revolve around that so and i think you know this is a perfect perfect image for what we are battling right now so we need some we need some naughty twins in our lives right now guys <laughs> not be afraid to battle all the things that are going on right now and there are lots of bad things from racism to mm. you know um, just your, you know, the coronavirus and all that. So we're going to use that, this vessel to help battle all this, kind of give us that hope. We so could use that. Is, I'm sorry? <laughs> we could use that. Yes, definitely. 
Sure. Now there's one twin, and I'm gonna draw a twin on the other side. We're twinning, boys. Now let's use the one I made today. Again, I, I'm not too, I'm just drawing on just the whim, you know, I'm not too. Concerned with, okay, hey, I want this to look exactly like a monarch. I mean, you can, and I could, but I'm just having fun right now. And that's what you want. And also, we're kind of short on time. <laughs> so but, we're think go ahead. But like I was saying, um, this carving tool that I just made just now with some repurposed materials is doing the exact same thing that a $60 carving tool would do, you know? So it's just a matter of... using your imagination and incorporating all that into this. Moving on, moving on, and also, you know, to have a successful carving on, on pottery, you got to experiment a whole lot with texture. You, so don't be afraid to, to create your own stamps, to experiment on what different household objects or just found objects, the prints they make. Now we're gonna start incorporating some flowers. One. Two. I think I'll make a cork for this guy. Make some matching glasses for it. I'm sure we're gonna all need a drink after it's all done. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ro. Yeah. When you're done this, um, we could open up, um, you know, unmute people and open up questions if you're game. I'm game. Okay. I'm um, always game. Tell me when you're ready and we'll go for it. Um, we can go for it right now. Okay. I can talk and carve. Can you chew gum too? I'm not chewing. I don't have any gum in here. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't. I'll make sure I won't fall. Okay, so if um, uh, when you see your unmute buttons go off, um, or uh, you're, you're mute, not muted anymore, you're welcome to ask questions of Ro. <clears throat> Ro, this is Laura from San Diego. Hi, Laura, how are you doing? I'm thrilled to make it this year to the Clay Festival. It's been Yay! on my list. <laughs> 
Um, so I do something like this, but I've started to use colored velvet underglaze, but what I find is the, I want it to be smoother and sanding is just gonna fill up the lines. So have you done that? Put another color in over the lines or maybe painting the velvet on first and then carving through it? I don't know, but then you can't put the darker, the oxide on. I hope I was Well, <laughs> um, well right now, um, this is pretty much smooth and it, it, it's already smooth. I mean, I don't have any rough edges on here already because okay. this is already at the leather hard stage. It's pretty sturdy. But I and meant it's, not, it's not it's not hard enough to where when I'm carving along, it'll create those little burrs. That's what you're talking about, right? No, I was saying if you wanted to put colored slip on after the design or on the white clay. Uh-huh. You I would like mine to be smoother when I apply it, but sanding it or sponging it makes it a mess. <laughs> okay. So, so like you, you could color the flower, but you wouldn't, it's too hard to paint in between the lines for me. I don't have the patience. Uh-huh. Again, that's just, it's, 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 anything you do with clay is going to involve patience. So if you're wanting more of a, a, um, a decorative feel, like you want uh -huh. to have all these areas, different colors, yeah. it's going to take some patience. And there's, there's nothing, you can't, there, you just can't sidestep that and i wish there was holy cow that would be make my job easier <laughs> you know but but you're gonna if if it's the if it's gonna be your total if you're looking for your outcome to be um a bit more um how do i say a bit more refined a bit more smoother then you're gonna apply that 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 time that effort into it okay uh, as far as as far as um, saying it's rough, this piece I brushed on earlier, and it's gonna, I'm gonna be able to carve off very easily right now. Um, is that what you're talking about? The burrs that are on here? See that, yes. <laughs> kind okay, of. So, so but I it's also this. the, the velvets are pretty thick. Okay, the vel okay. The, there's two kinds of underglaze you can get. You can get the velvet glaze, which is has a rough surface. That's what you're talking about, the rough surface. Right. Okay. The, the yeah, velvet so maybe glaze. That's the problem. The velvet glaze will have a rough surface. Surface. They make another okay. underglaze that has a more of a um, glossy finish to it. So. Do we I. I prefer the velvet underglaze. I prefer that rough, that rough um, underglaze, that the the texture that it creates. Because there's some pieces that I, I I make. I like that. I like that rough texture. I won't put any glaze on top of it. Okay. After this is done, I will glaze these. I will glaze this band right here with a clear glaze, and that will make it a smooth finish. Okay. I won't have that velvet roughness because I applied my clear glaze over it. Okay. Is that your question? Yes, but if you were going to carve on the black now, it wouldn't be, I guess that's just the artistic process. It's going to show the hand of the maker and it can't be perfect. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and it's not going to be perfect. Nothing, nothing in the world is ever perfect. I think a, a lot of my students have that, have that, um, tendency to want things to be perfect and the, and it's yeah you've got to understand it's it's never going to be perfect now take a look at this um one thing you can do is have a brush handy a dry brush yes a dry brush handy and fluff off some, the little clay dealies yeah it'll wipe off the little clay dealies there Okay. But if you hit the clay body at the right time, you can see that it comes off very nicely on its own. Uh, that's part of my problem. It's not the right time and I have to try to yes. finish that. So, yes, so, and that is just finding that right time. 
there is a magic hour when you're carving and you have to experiment with that clay. Don't we call that happy hour? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and where I do clay, you can drink wine because it's at a winery. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Truly. So you can oh, see. Oh, I love that. I'm very carefully carving this piece away. Right. Uh. And my I'm I'm not touching any of the black right, right. now. Because I don't want to disturb it or leave finger marks on it. Right. See ya. This is like scraffito, but much bolder and more exciting to me than tiny little lines. Yes. And then I'm going to put a little. Stem there. I like that. Now, you can see the little tiny burrs uh -huh. on there. I won't mess with those right now. Okay. I'll wait. I will wait and leave this until it's leather, until it's fully bone dry. And then I'll take my brush and I'll brush those burrs away. Long enough. And, um, what's going to happen is, you're going to notice, you know, as you're working along, like I was saying, I, I'm inspired by wood blocks and a lot of times I'm inspired by simple wood blocks. And I like to have my pieces be a little simple because they'll, I, I find that they'll carry a, a much louder voice when I do that. People can interpret it rather than just have it in their face. Yes, because sometimes there, there'll be too much going on. Right. And that just comes with experience and hearing and seeing the feedback you get from your customers to your fans to all that, you know, it's just a matter of seeing what works best for you. So I know you're in New Mexico and I'm in San Diego and pretty much everything just got shut down here and all of our outdoor festivals are done and I know Santa Fe is all gone for the summer. Yes. Is there anything we could say about how people are promoting their work out there besides putting it on the internet, which I really don't have any skills in, but I guess I'm going to have to do that. Yeah. You know what? Um, I, for a long time, have had a website and I was getting a lot of traffic, but it was, it was um, stolen from a bigger company once it got moved. And after that, I, I left it alone, right? Mm -hmm. And I've been, I figured, you know what? My social media accounts have been really good to me. And I'm just going to keep it like that. And that was before all this stuff happened with Corona. Right. And now I'm going to be toying around with getting my website up and running again. So it's up until then, you know, live streaming, live streaming um, your work. I've had lots of success with live streaming. Hmm. You do I've great had, at it. I've had lots of success with um, my my social media accounts because I do I built that up with a lot of customers in the past years, and I think that when all this happened, they kept following me and seeing what I was doing and 
also noticed, hey, you know what? You're not just a potter. You paint, you sculpt, you draw. And a lot of my, I'm, I'm keeping busy right now because of all that, all the extra things that I'm doing, finding creative ways to, to keep my art going, to keep going. Well, yeah. yes. um, I think there might be some other people who have questions too. Um, if oh, they I'm want. sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's all good. They, you asked very great, great questions. Um, but is there anybody else who'd like to ask a question? Maybe. Sure, I'll ask a question. Um, are you firing these uh, reduction or? Uh, All the pieces that I'm, I'm working on right now are going to be fired reduction. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be cone 10 in a, um, a reduction kiln. With the exception of the twin monster slayer um, bottle <laughs> here. This one's going to be um, um, in an electric kiln. And it's going to, I'm going to have, um, um, it's going to, I'm going to be firing it oxidation to um, cone six. Cone six oxidation. And, but all the rest are going to be high fired. So, and another thing too, I think going back to the question of, of marketing your work, my carvings, I normally um, save my carvings for bigger pieces, but, but they've, I've had, I found a lot of people no, notice a lot of people really want or interested in, in my carvings as well, but really can't okay, well, I'll have to save up for that larger piece. And so I, I started making some smaller pieces and adding them to my more um, functional pieces. Like this is going to be a mug right here. Mm -hmm. so, so that's kind of what I'm, where I'm headed right now. Um, okay, uh, it, it, are there any other questions? I do, I, I, I normally, I fired... Cone 10 reduction for, boy, a long time. And I didn't really start experimenting with cone 6 oxidation in an electric kiln until I started teaching. And I really like the vibrant colors that the electric kiln is possible of and is creating. So it, it, it just made me have a, um, made me have a better um, appreciation for a lot of different clay techniques. It's opened my eyes in a different way. So I've been experimenting a whole lot with both the cone six oxidation as well as the um, cone 10 reduction. Are there any more questions? This piece right now is a little too wet for me to carve and I can, you can see it's kind of sticking. But I'm okay with that. I'm just, I'm just carving along while you guys ask questions. I'm carving along with you guys. I'm having a lot of fun. Are we um, all set with questions then? Um, is there anything else that you'd like to say, Ro? Well, as of right now, I think a lot of people are finding new ways to create pottery um, either in their homes or in other studios that are slowly starting to reopen right now. Um, I think that um, that there are lots of different different techniques out there that we just have to be open with and be able to share with. Um, I've always been been open and and willing to share my techniques and um i think that that comes from my experience as a native american 
and seeing a lot of Native American um, traditional potters who are very uh, secretive of their their techniques, which is fine because a lot of a lot of these Native potters want to keep that within their families. But then there are a lot of Native Americans who are young Native Americans who are not interested in creating traditional pottery anymore. You know, because it is, they want to do, be engineers or computer programmers or whatever, you know? So the traditional potter kind of has to be able to and willing to share their techniques if they, if we want these, these, um, this, traditional method to continue on. So that's kind of where I'm at with with pottery. And that's why I'm always open to share my techniques and share my share my experiences with clay. And sometimes I am successful with a piece, sometimes I'm not. And I think we all have to be willing to take that gamble on experimenting and just sharing, being able to share. You know what they say, sharing is caring. <laughs> That's great. Um, I, I would think too that um, when you share a technique, people take the parts that fit them and adapt it to their own vision. Yes. And, and so you still um, have a singular voice in there. Yes. And like I said, if everyone carves on a lot, of, there's a lot of people that carve on their work and it's, it's nothing new. And it's just a matter of how you incorporate your, your voice, your, who you are into your work. That's going to break it away. Right. It's a continuing process too. I mean, I've watched your work develop over the years. And the carving part has gotten stronger and stronger, um, and and that um, the visual images are are also um, gotten to be less subtle and more um, vocal. I guess it would be the same. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, that's that has come that has grown and taking its own life within my work because I, I, I noticed that it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to voice who you are in, in pottery. You know, people are just, their mind is set on centering this piece of clay and glazing it so you don't ruin it or whatever, you know, firing. There, there's so many things your mind is on. But once you get all, once you got all that down, and you know your material, you know your medium, then you're free to express what's out there. And I've always, I, I've always found that you know what, clay is just as strong a medium to voice who you are, whether it's something fun, whether it's something more political whether it's something more deeper than just, you know, whatever, just a, just a shape. And I think a lot of people have a hard time realizing that clay can be a medium like that. It's not just paintings and sculptors are not the only, only art mediums that can voice your opinion. Clearly, yes. So I'm thinking that it's time to wrap it up and um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us and thank Ro for sharing. Um, uh, he has a gift and he's really good at sharing his gift um, and I'm grateful that he was here today. So thank you for all thank attending. You. Thank you. Thanks everyone for, for showing up. I'm not sure how many people showed up, but it was fun. We had lots of fun. Now let's take a look at what we did today real quick. 
So we have this, this is gonna be a mug. I'll have a nice handle here. We made this piece here, nice little vase, small flower vase, and you can see that flower there. We also made and brushed on the slip. Now this one's ready to carve. Another thing we did today is, well, we got a lot of carvings done today. Yeah, you did well. We made this piece here. And the piece that started it all was a tile. Cool. So. Awesome. And we also made tools. <laughs> cool. Yes. Cool. We got a lot done today, guys. Holy cow, what a workshop, huh? We yeah, got like three days in 45 minutes. <laughs> not bad, not bad. Um, hopefully next year, the Clay Festival, everybody's here in New Mexico. Um, we're on site um, yes. as well as sharing. Yes, yes. All right. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Silver City Clay Festival, for having me. Um, thank you, Diana, for, for being the Nothing. voice of reason on this <laughs> scope today or this um, Zoom meeting. <laughs> And keeping me in check. You know, sometimes my mouth will get me in trouble. <laughs> All right. Thank you, folks. All right. We'll see you guys. And David, if you're watching, I hope you had fun. <laughs> Bye, guys. I'm going in.